winter in the North American heartland. Dozens of enormous ships lie in repose, huddled together, locked by ice into their winter berths. Their deck logbooks are closed with a single cryptic word, lay up. Across the region, more than three million tons of cargo capacity is idle due to weather. It happens every year on the Great Lakes. Yet this is only an interim, a pause. In reality, the beginning of the next new season in an industry that never rests. Beneath their icy decks, these boats, some of them modern, others more than seven decades old, are primped and pampered before it is time for them to go to work again. Outside, bundled workers spray and roll fresh color onto their hulls. For some, the time to go to work comes earlier than for others, before the ice melts away, before the snow has receded into springtime. Here it's still winter, but cargo orders compel their owners to move these giants at the first sign of thaw. Deliberately, they churn and push like this one, one of the largest, forcing its way down a channel barely big enough to let it pass. Like Ogle Bay Norton's workhorse steamer Buckeye, the smaller boats come out as well. Following the courses opened by others, the Buckeye plows through shattered ice, pushing its way upbound through the St. Mary's River. From inside the forward end, the pounding is deafening. Each large cake hammers against the bow, pounding on the steel plate, and tosses the boat back and forth relentlessly. This time of year, this can go on for days.
the wheel washed tosses jagged chunks upward against the Buckeyes counter, leaving them to tumble away in the wake. As winter's early dusk overtakes them, a short convoy, Herbert C. Jackson, Bell River, and the John G. Munson, follow onto the Birch Point Range, going to anchor for the night. It's a job done for now. The 55-year-old cutter Mackinac battles back to the Sioux. While at anchor, the Buckeye rolls lazily, waiting for weather. Whitefish Bay is the last shelter before the long run up Lake Superior and the objective of ships coming off of their downbound courses. In the distance, Whitefish Point Light winks over ice-littered Lake Superior, wind blown in a springtime gale. The following morning, the Buckeye proceeds while the Bell River follows, shrouding its forward end in ice. Below decks, the Buckeye works noisily in the head sea. While this might sound something like an old slow steam engine, it's actually the creak and groan of the boat's inner hull in foul weather. This tunnel below decks is the only passage from the forward accommodations to those aft when the weather prohibits walking on the deck from the pilot house to the engine room. It's also the way through which vital steam, electric, and hydraulic lines must pass. For the first time since last year's layup, deckhands pop the clamps on the Buckeye's hatches. Having covered more than 375 miles after weighing anchor in Whitefish, the Buckeye enters Duluth Harbor on the morning of the next day. The clatter of the hatch wrenches echoes across the icy harbor. The decks are sheeted, making work and walking treacherous on the cambered steel. As the Buckeye reaches into the harbor, the hatch covers are lifted away using a deck crane. Each cover weighs more than an automobile, and the Buckeye has 22 of them. The approach to the dock is slow and deliberate. As the boat gets alongside, deck hands are swung out on the landing boom, dangling over the side, then lowered to the dock where they will handle the mooring wires. As the steamer probes into the morning shadows behind the dock, it's evident that its superstructure has been designed to avoid striking the loading chutes. The Buckeye creeps along slowly while sailors renew the acquaintances. In minutes, the chutes are lowered into the open hatches, and the first run of 22,000 tons of ore pellets pounds into the Buckeye's empty holes.
Later, the loading is interrupted by the Canadian Tadasac, also on its first voyage, forcing the Buckeye to shift astern by using its own deck winches, thus making room at the dock ahead. In the early afternoon, the John G. Munson, which had arrived in Duluth first, departs with its first cargo of the season, bound for Conneaut, while the Buckeye resumes loading. The Munson, built as a self-unloader, is the largest of the old Bradley fleet boats now operating in the combined U.S. steel fleet. Hours later, as the afternoon sun casts long shadows over the ice, the Buckeye backs out. On deck, the hatch covers are clamped. Then the Buckeye swings to its final approach to the Duluth Ship Canal, signaling for an open bridge and waiting for the bridge's answer. On the following day, ice still chokes the Sioux River but it's broken enough to allow boats to meet in two-way traffic. Here, the Burns Harbor, one of a dozen lake ships 1,000 feet long, passes the Buckeye, pushing tons of shattered ice before its blunt bow and shares a salute. The captain shouts greetings in from the top deck of the Burns Harbor's after house, a structure the equivalent of a six-story apartment building. In a large measure, what makes this early navigation possible is the brute capacity of a ship more than a half a century old, the icebreaker Mackinac. The Mack was built during the Second World War, specifically to keep Great Lakes shipping lanes open and extend shipping seasons so that the raw materials of war production would continue to flow to the industrial centers of the lower lakes. The Mack is still impressively useful. Here, the Mac is stopped in a wedge of solid ice in the St. Mary's River with a ladder down for the crew members paying visits to a newer Canadian icebreaker nearby. The boat is a marvel of simple technology, employing a propeller in its bow, inboard of an overhanging forefoot. This enables the Mackinac to pull water out from under the ice surface. 
then ride over the ice to crush it down. The Max 105-foot beam cuts a swath for the full beam of the largest of the Lakers. Were it not for the public outcry in the region, the Mac might have been scrapped a decade ago due to budget cuts. Instead of being scrapped, the Mackinac was refitted extensively at a cost of millions. In a tandem joint venture, both American and Canadian boats lead convoys up and down the Sioux River until the spring thaw is completed. As the Buckeye moves into the lower river, it meets the Charles M. Beakley, preparing to lock upbound. Currents have already cleared broken ice out of Lake Nicolette in the lower river as the Buckeye approaches the infamous rock cut. A narrow artificial channel which was blasted out of solid bedrock to create a downbound channel separate from the natural course of the Nebish, thus enabling a safer one-way traffic in each channel between Mud Lake and Nine Mile Point. Seen from high atop the Hopper House, which is aft, the Buckeye is similar to her cousins. Until the early 70s, Lakers were built in the conventional fore and aft profile. That profile had evolved in the earliest years of steamboat cargo navigation in the pilot waters of the lakes. Pilot house well forward, engine room well aft, leaving a long, unbroken cargo space between. But the Buckeye, like every other laker, has its own unique identity. On close inspection, dome tank top trunks stand in pairs along the side fences. These are vestiges of the boat's original construction in Maryland. As Bethlehem steals Sparrows Point, the boat was designed with upper wing tanks for carrying petroleum cargo. At the time, the typical Laker loaded for its return trip to the upper lakes with a cargo of coal for power plants on Lake Superior. As these power plants converted to oil, it was thought that a return trip oil cargo would enhance revenue. Not one drop was ever carried by the Sparrows Point. As the Buckeye searches down the lake, daily chores occupy the sailor's time. This is a 24-hour operation, no stopping off to rest on the way, and it must be self-sufficient. Seamen apply a variety of skills to the daily routines. Men work, eat, and sleep as the boat continues its course. Often the vigilance of the engineer down below and the mate in the wheelhouse is taken for granted. The pilot house of the Buckeye is an anachronistic mix of old steamboat paraphernalia and high-tech electronics. The most basic of fittings, compass, steering gear, engine order telegraph or Chadburn are augmented by radar, satellite communication, and computers. In the open lake, as the mate tends to navigation and his other watch-standing responsibilities, the wheelsman stands lookout while the autopilot maintains the course. Deep below decks in the machinery spaces, the surroundings are impervious to the weather up above. The boiler makes steam, the shaft turns, the boat sails onward.
River transits offer numerous opportunities to talk to old shipmates. Here, the 1,000-foot Ogle Bay Norton glides by and balanced, one of 13 active vessels in the same fleet as the Buckeye. It is also one of the landlocked 1,000-footers. While built in the 70s, these boats were among the largest in the world. Although they're capable of carrying excess of 72,000 tons at full load draft, they're restricted to about 60,000 per voyage by limiting channel depths. Because they're far too large to manage the St. Lawrence Seaway, these giants will never go beyond the freshwater seas of the heartland. The Algo Rail, built as a Roy A. Jodry, was designed as a self-unloader for Algamas Steel in Canada and is part of one of the lake's largest working fleets. Its size, 639 feet long and 72 feet wide, enables the Algo Rail to make seaway transits easily. Thus, the Algo Rail's range extends from the head of the lakes all the way out to the saltwater environs of the St. Lawrence. The steamer Armco was built as a long, sleek, straight-deck ore carrier in the 60s. As a result of the economic pressures of the 80s, the Armco was retrofitted with self-unloading machinery. The mechanical technologies applied to the Armco are markedly different from those designed into the Alga Rail. Although cargo capacity was sacrificed, turnaround time was significantly improved, adding several full voyages. Therefore, more total tonnage delivered to a typical season. The Edgar Spear is one of 2,000 footers in the U.S. steel fleet. The Spear has distinct differences from most of its cousins. Built for specially designed loading and receiving facilities, the Spear's hatches are on 48-foot centers rather than the more conventional 24-foot. There is no long conveyor boom cradle along the Spear's deck. Instead, a transverse shuttle is employed, and the Spear was designed for a smaller crew, so the accommodation house is significantly smaller. The motor vessel Algonorth, also of the Algama Steel Fleet, represents a new direction in Canadian shipping. Brand new in the 80s, it measures 730 feet long and 75 feet wide, maximum seaway dimensions. This diesel ship travels out to the Labrador coast to bring back ore pellets for the Algama mill at the Sioux, then operates offshore in international trade during the off-season. On a breezy afternoon, the Buckeye slides into Astabula, assisted at its forward end by the Great Lakes tug, Rhode Island.
With the installation of balanced stern thrusters in most lake boats, tug assist has all but vanished. Yet when conditions warrant, captains use tugs to muscle their boats into and out of tight spots. These boats were originally built as steam tugs. Indeed, hundreds of photographs of these same boats belching smoke from tall stacks still survive. In the 50s and 60s, they were changed to diesel to give them more responsiveness and maneuverability. Their skippers handle ships in a way that is unique in the world. Typically, they utilize a tow line off to their stern bits. Although when working the bow of a ship, they shoulder up even to the point of putting the tug between hull and dock. Their low profile, the result of the retrofit, makes them very stable, enabling the captain to use brute power in tight spots. He steers with a lever that works something like a tiller. It controls a shroud around the propeller called a steering court nozzle, developed especially for these tugs nearly 40 years ago. Great Lakes Tugmen have a reputation as some of the most skilled in the world, which is only fitting, for they assist the most skilled ship handling captains in the world. The thousand footer is the most stark reminder of the true purpose of these vessels, cargo. Boat aficionados and their enthusiasm and appreciation of aesthetics sometimes forget that these boats exist to carry cargo, to make money. As plain as it is, the barge-like thousand foot laker is a model of cost-effective bulk transport. Whether they are large or small, aesthetically pleasing or not, these boats must move cargo. Along with safe navigation, the timely and efficient handling of that cargo is of prime importance. Typically, bulk cargo is loaded from shoreside conveyors. Loading is done day and night, in all weathers. At some docks, the boat is shifted ahead and astern to line up with the loading facility. At others, the loading rig moves to accommodate the hatches. Stone and coal cargoes typically fit most or all of the cargo spaces. The more dense taconite and iron ore product fills only the forward and after ends of the hole, leaving the midships almost half empty at summer drafts. Draft is an indication of displacement or the actual weight of the ship in the water. The conversion is taken from architectural calculations provided to the mates. Simply put, the weight of the empty ship is subtracted from the weight of the full ship. The difference is the weight of the cargo in tons. To further confuse the issue, stone is measured in short tons, called net tons by Lakes Convention, or is measured in long tons, called gross tons. The Buckeye sinks bodily approximately one inch for every 100 tons of cargo loaded. At the Duluth and Mesabi docks, the oldest technology still does the job. Rail cars filled with ore pellets are pushed out onto the top level of the dock, 
which stretches more than a quarter of a mile into the harbor. They dump by gravity into the empty sections of the dock structure called pockets. The foreman arranges the amounts according to the loading sequence typically used by the next boat due to load. Each pocket holds up to four carloads or about 300 tons. After the boat spots alongside, the mate directs the dock boss to fill specific hatches from specific pockets. The chutes are lowered, a gate open, and the entire contents of a pocket dumps into the hole. Some pockets hold only one or two carloads. These are typically saved until the end of the load when the mate uses them to trim the boat to the final draft. Once a run of pockets has been emptied into the boat, the deck winches are used to shift ahead or astern to spot under full chutes. Lake sailors call a dock like this one a shifting dock or a chute dock. At another of the Masabi docks in Duluth, the facility has been modified to utilize conveyor belts. These belts deliver a pre-ordered tonnage into specific hatches. By using multiple conveyors rather than one single belt shuttle, hours are shaved off the loading time. These belts are spotted on 48-foot centers, requiring the Buckeye and most other ships to shift only once during the cargo operation. The conventional spacing of hatches developed in direct connection to the design of these and scores of other gravity docks around the lakes in the last century. The old chutes were spaced on 12-foot centers. The earliest large steam freighters were built with hatches on 12-foot centers. Sailors called them hatch farms because they were literally dozens of hatches on a boat with very little space between them. As newer, larger boats required more structural deck strength, hatches were placed on 24-foot centers. The Buckeyes hatches are on 24-foot centers. Bulk self-unloading is nearly a century old on the Great Lakes, originally developed to accommodate cargo deliveries in small backorder ports that lacked onshore machinery. Self-unloading has proven its cost-effectiveness so well that nearly all Great Lakes bulkers are self-unloaders. In fact, Great Lakes shipyards have exported this technology to foreign flag seagoing ships as well. Like the Buckeye, dozens of boats which were originally built as straight deckers for the iron ore trade have been retrofitted with hopper bottoms, conveyor systems, and unloading booms, fundamentally changing the way they operate, let alone the way they look. Self-unloading requires workers below decks in the closed wet spaces under the cargo hold, deeper than the water line. It also requires crew on deck to handle machinery. Here, by delicately manipulating ballast and boom, the Buckeye moves 20,000 tons of limestone from its hole to a growing mountain on the dock in less than four hours. Once finished, the holes are thoroughly rinsed. Every pebble needs to be cleaned out to prevent cross-contamination with subsequent cargoes. As they are clean, the hatches are covered and clamped for the ballast portion of the voyage. Finally, the boom is shipped in and rested over the deck.
As the season progresses, trips become more pleasant, almost cruise-like. This summery morning finds the Buckeye approaching one of the Great Lakes' most impressive landmarks. Spanning the Straits of Mackinac, the five-mile-long Mackinac Bridge is an engineering marvel, carrying interstate traffic between two Michigan peninsulas, dividing the straits that separate two Great Lakes. When the bridge opened, it eliminated the need of ferry boat service, which had for decades been the connection between Upper and Lower Michigan. And though it had become obsolete, the ferry boat chief, Wawatam, survived more than two decades more as the last hand-fired coal-burning steamer on the Great Lakes. During one stage of the bridge construction, self-unloaders from the old Bradley fleet laid alongside the tower caissons, filling them with stone quarried only a few miles away at Cedarville. Two towers, reaching over 500 feet in total height, carry the weight of 41,000 miles of stranded wire, which in turn suspend this four-lane segment of Interstate 75. Minutes after passing beneath the bridge, the Buckeye threads through Round Island Passage with picturesque Mackinac Island close on the port side. Motor vehicles are prohibited on Mackinac, preserving its 19th century charm that attracts thousands of visitors every summer season. The island's most well-known showplace is the very formal Grand Hotel, whose spacious porch overlooks the streets. By evening, the Buckeye is at the Sioux Locks again. This lock transit does become routine, but all the more pleasant as the Sioux warms up and visitors begin to come to watch the boats. After landing deckhands, the Buckeye eases into the chamber of the MacArthur Lock. The fit is close. Lake captains, who are pilots themselves, handle their own boats here. There are typically no tugs, typically no shoreside mechanical aids. Altogether, there are four locks. Next to the MacArthur is the Poe, seen here to the immediate right. The Poe was reconstructed in the late 60s to accommodate the thousand footers. Next to the Poe are the Davis and Sabin locks. In the heydays of lake shipping, the Davis was built to fit two 600 foot lakers end to end. There was a time when these locks carried more cargo tonnage in a year than the Panama Canal, when the constant parade of long ships passing both ways kept all four locks constantly filling and dropping day and night. This evening, the Buckeye is alone, rising to the level of Lake Superior in a matter of minutes, hurried only by the urgency of its own schedule. On the lake, as warm, humid summer air overtakes winter's bitterness, fog is almost constant for most of the season. It blinds a boat's course, but does not stop it.
Radar and other electronic aids enable the lake boats to keep accurate courses and safe distances, even in the densest of fogs. Down below, there is no fog. There is no weather at all. Here in the hum and whine and rumble of the after end, engineers and oilers go about their appointed rounds. To the uninitiated, it might seem that it all runs by itself. Indeed, this is a far cry from the early days of steam-propelled ships in which these men were part of the black gang, tending coal fires and freewheeling piston engines. Automation technology integrates networks of alarms, relays and solenoid valves, and electric motors that control the fine balances of fuel and draft, water levels and steam pressures. Oilers and engineers constantly monitor the entire system, gauge by gauge every hour. By keeping records, any changes can be immediately spotted. Besides propulsion, the engine room supplies the boat with auxiliary services as well. Lights and electricity, heat and ventilation and water. Everything from cooking to unloading to navigation depends on this careful vigilance. Underway, the constant spinning of the shaft and propeller is driven by some 700 pounds of steam pressure. A pressure high enough that a leak in a supply steam line could remove a man's finger. This pressure drives against hundreds of finely tooled turbine blades inside the engine casing spin in the turbine to develop about 5,000 horsepower. Occasionally, the nozzles that atomize heavy fuel into the white-hot fire need to be tended to maintain this pressure. A modern boiler is a closed system. Water passes through hundreds of feet of tubes that pass through the fire. This flashes water to steam. The steam passes through valves to the turbines and auxiliaries then exhaust to a condenser where it becomes water again, then returns to the boiler tubes. Because of the possibility of a breakdown underway, the boat carries a full supply of spare parts, gaskets, fittings, and the tools to make repairs on board. A machine shop occupies an entire side of one deck. Here water levels are controlled and monitored in the ballast tanks from one of the deepest points of the engine room. Soundings are measured using long mercury filled king gauges. While maneuvering, the engineer controls the engine speed by opening and closing throttle valves with these wheels. Here he's just been given a slow ahead. To reduce propeller speed to the desired revolutions, he has opened the reverse turbine momentarily, then closed it, and now adjusts a head pressure to maintain 40 RPM. The gauges above the throttles enable him to visually monitor the most vital systems as he controls steam pressure to the engine by hand. The slow ahead order goes on for a long time. Good ship handling captains use a bare minimum of bells or engine orders. Occasionally though, in spite of great care and skill, a laker finds a shoal. Once he determines that the boat cannot be freed with ship's propulsion alone, the captain calls for assistance.
In this case, larger open water tugs are called to assist the G tugs. Sometimes the angles are awkward, putting even the tugboats at risk. The efforts of four powerful tugboats yield no progress into the evening, so a barge is brought alongside. The freighter unloads into the barge in a process called lightering. Only a few hundred tons need to be removed, raising the boat an inch for every hundred tons, releasing it from the grips of the shoal. Although a Great Lakes Voyager trip averages only three to four days, a Great Lakes seaman remains on board at work for three to four months at a time, taking periodic vacations during the season, but also looking forward to the next winter layup when he can spend more time at home. But before they can get to home and hearth, they have to get through November. Great Lakes weather has worldwide notoriety among those in the know. Its reputation was made when the very first European ship, the French Griffin, probed into the lakes in 1679 and never returned. Since then, over the centuries, and most especially in the last 150 years, hundreds of ships, small and large, under sail and steam, have succumbed to gales and storms, which even saltwater shipmasters admit are some of the fiercest anywhere in the world. This is because weather systems in this region, developing along the continental polar front, are capable of generating frequent changes in wind and violent wave systems from several different directions. Thousands have died in these freshwater seas. Today's Lakers, which are enormous steel vessels, toughly built and solid underfoot, are capable of taking a pounding. Nevertheless, their unique designs, long and narrow compared to ocean-going ships, make them more susceptible to the extreme forces of a heavy sea. In 1975, the Edmund Fitzgerald, a boat only 16 years old, carried 29 men to the bottom in the last lost of life ship sinking on the Great Lakes. 
Lake pilots have been plotting weather for generations. Modern technology gives them the added edge of acquiring real-time satellite images of dynamic weather patterns. This crucial information wow. affects routing decisions and the more fundamental decision whether to seek shelter or continue moving. For a boat and ballast, as this one is, this 12 to 15 foot sea seems tolerable on the proper course. On a broadside course, it could be disastrous. Furthermore, if the boat was in cargo, with its freeboard reduced to 9 or 10 feet, these same seas would be washing tons of green water freely across the deck. The captain's decision weighs in the balance factors like the safety of his vessel and crew, the urgency of his schedule, and the changing dynamics of the weather, especially in November, which is never entirely predictable. On November 10, 1975, the Edmund Fitzgerald was lost with all hands in gale force weathers only 17 miles northwest of Whitefish Point on Lake Superior. We will soon be conducting a memorial service up forward here for those uh, sailors that went down with the Edmund Fitzgerald 20 years ago today. There's about uh, an eight foot sea running here. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, go outside and find an area that's uh, not too windy and uh, record this for, for the folks at home. A little ice built up here already. We're here in the uh, rec room of the uh, Steamer Buckeye. Uh, we're about to hold a, a memorial, a uh, small memorial service for those uh, comrades that uh, went down 20 years ago, uh, uh, just about at this point here uh, on Lake Superior, and uh, weather which was much more fierce than we're experiencing today. It's, it's uh, quite blustery outside, so uh, we'll just say a, a couple of words here, and then we'll go on out and, and lay the wreath. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have ever, forever lasting life. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Amen. Okay, fellas, we'll uh, put on our coat and we'll go out and we'll lay the wreath uh, in Lake Superior. Well, we're back inside now, and the uh, sound that you hear in the background is the wheelsman uh, tolling the bell 29 times for those mariners that went down on the Edmund Fitzgerald 20 years ago today.